and we're going to turn the coast off. So Emily is going to tell us about I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there is a sign that's on the room. Thanks so much, Omer. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Emily Black. I'm a postdoc at Stanford University working at Reg Lab with Daniel Ho. Thank you so much for having me here. Today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, fairness and unfairness beyond multi-calibration. I'm going to talk about all of the choices that we have that we, when, that we um, have the option to make when we're building a machine learning model and how we can leverage those choices to mitigate unfairness in machine learning. So um, a lot of us have probably seen fairness papers that go something like this. We have a model and some prediction task. Uh, we have some notion of fairness that maybe we've defined, and we constrain a model to satisfy that fairness definition. And that's wonderful. That's excellent. It leads to sort of transferable situation um, solutions to fairness problems across a variety of models and application tasks. But what do we do when this doesn't work super well in practice? And is this the main tool that we have in our toolbox to mitigate unfair behavior on the ground? Um, well, there's kind of a lot going on underneath the hood when we make a machine learning model. Uh, we have a lot of decisions to make, everything from what a model's prediction target should be when we're trying to sort of approximate uh, a predictable task from a policy or business one. Uh, we have all the little steps that we take turning the data that we're given into stuff that a model can understand through feature engineering, uh, even the hyperparameters that we have on the model. And this can all ostensibly affect um, fairness behavior. So while we most often intervene on, say, the optimization procedure or the prediction procedure, ostensibly we could choose kind of any choice that we make within the machine learning pipeline, the model building process, to make fair models. Um, and there's been a lot of work recently showing that these choices do have a huge impact on model behavior and specifically on fairness behavior. So some of you may have heard about this really famous paper that came out recently from Ziad Obermeyer et al. Um, about how switching the prediction task in a healthcare distribution model, so a model that was allocating healthcare in a population, you could reduce the um, racial bias in the predictions of that model by changing the prediction task from something that was effect essentially uh, predicting how expensive that person's healthcare needs would be to something that was differently correlated with health. And that ended up reducing racial bias by quite a lot. A paper that I'm going to talk about in this presentation is how um, in IRS tax audit models, so choosing who is audited by the IRS, you can reduce the uh, kind of overburden some amounts of audits on lower income individuals by switching the prediction target um, in that situation as well. So I'll go in more into that later. But even smaller uh, changes in the model building process, like how you pre-process your data, have also been shown to have huge fairness impact. So there's this interesting paper by Ada Wan from the University of Zurich that shows that uh, if you, you know, there's often this talk about differences in accuracy and translation across different languages and NLP models. What she shows is that um, if you you can mitigate this at least partially and substantially by making sure that the size of the smallest unit of language that's going into these models is the same across all languages. So you have some models that you have some languages with longer words, some languages with shorter words. If you chop up the words inside uh, languages with longer words, you actually can mitigate some of the translation um, accuracy differences uh, across models. And even you know, tiny changes like changes to model hyperparameters can also impact model behavior pretty substantially. This doesn't just happen in predictions as has been shown, for example, by Marx et al., uh, but also in a model's internals. So it's you know, how a prediction is made. So this paper, um, from ICLR of last year, uh, selected ensembles for consistent predictions. In the beginning shows how even if you just change a deep model's random seed, the top features that it relies upon to make a prediction for a given point can actually change somewhat substantially. Um, so, you know, with all of this in mind, given that there's so many decisions to make and they seem to have such a huge impact on model behavior, a natural question to ask maybe is, how can we leverage the choices that we make along the pipeline to change model fairness behavior? And what are the repercussions of the freedom that the, all these choices allow us? 
And I'm going to attempt to start to answer these questions by talking to you guys about two papers. Um, in the first, I'm talking about an example of leveraging higher order changes to uh, the modeling pipeline. So changing the prediction target in IRS tax income models and how this can impact fairness with respect to income. Um, and then the second paper, I'm gonna talk about just the situation where say you're like, okay, Emily, I can't change my whole gosh darn model. I already have my prediction target. I already have most of my data. Uh, well, even when you have your uh, prediction target set and your data set, and uh, maybe you can't even change your model's accuracy that much uh, for the sake of fairness, even in that situation, um, we still have a lot of flexibility to have models with different fairness behaviors. And there are, it's even easier actually in that situation to tie the fact that you do have flexibility and freedom to repercussions in the law. So I'm gonna show how uh, some something called the disparate impact doctrine uh, interacts with some of the freedom that we have along the machine learning pipeline. And you know, while I'm gonna show you two examples of papers that talk about sort of how we can leverage the pipeline and the repercussions of the choices that we have along that pipeline, I hope what you'll uh, take away from this talk, you know, if, if you take away anything, is uh, just how much freedom we really do have when making machine learning models um, and how uh, we could, we should hopefully look into leveraging more of these choices to make uh, fair models as we continue to make more and more models in more and more places. <clears throat> okay, but first as promised, I'll talk about the IRS. Uh, so in this project through a novel collaboration with the um, uh, Internal Revenue Service and Stanford, we are investigating the use of um, AI and ML systems in the tax audit selection process. So who the Internal Revenue Service is selecting to investigate their tax returns because they think that there was something done wrong on their taxes. And we focus in particular on investigating um, fairness of AI selected audit allocations with respect to taxpayer income. And in order to investigate fairness with respect to taxpayer income, we sort of found that a lot of the common fairness definitions and desiderata didn't fit quite exactly with what we wanted. Um, and also if you're taking into account IRS buy-in, there was you know, maybe a little bit of uh, discussions about you know, what's the right thing to do and all of this stuff. So instead of um, uh, using some of the more sort of common fairness definitions, we relied upon this notion from the public finance literature called vertical equity, which is centered around treating different people appropriately differently to achieve fairness. I'll go into that briefly a little bit later. Um, but what we find basically is that off the shelf fairness mitigation methods don't always function so well in public policy context, especially because of the fact that in this situation where we have a budgeted allocation problem. So some of the mitigation techniques that are um, common in the literature sort of deal with the whole model and not the fact that you might only be using a small subset of it um, beyond sort of the conceptual differences with what we um, hope for behaviorally from the model. And what we find instead is that by changing some of the modeling decisions that we've made along the way when building an IRS tax audit model, namely changing the prediction target from just uh, predicting binary whether or not someone is likely to misreport to uh, the expected value of how much they are likely to misreport on their taxes, that ends up being arguably a more effective method of mitigating unfair behavior with respect to income. But first, I'm going to talk about some background um, on IRS data, how tax audits work, and like the IRS in general. Then I'm going to give you some motivating facts based off of that data that we have access to about how audits work right now and how they may or may not be unfair. I'll briefly describe the audit problem, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about vertical equity and how we sort of conceptualize that, um, and then some results before I move on to my discussion of model multiplicity. So taxes fund the US government, but tax collection doesn't always work perfectly. Uh, the estimated tax gap yearly is about $450 billion, which is about 20% of all income tax liability. And um, just in case, I'm sorry if I didn't cover this earlier, but the IRS is the Internal Revenue Service. That's the agency and the government that collects people's taxes that they pay. Um, so that, that's good with everyone. Awesome, okay. Um, so uh, there's a $450 billion. <laughs> uh, there's a there's 20 percent of all income tax liability in this project we're just working with individual income tax so we're not thinking about businesses or anything like that um so 
In order to recover lost revenue and to deter noncompliance with the tax code, the uh, IRS audits individuals. So they look into the tax forms that they think are not compliant with the tax code. But how these audits can proceed differ based on where you sit on the income spectrum. So if you're on the higher end of the income spectrum, if you have more money, uh, you're likely to get a request for excess tax liability after an investigation has taken place. Um, however, if you're on the lower end of the income spectrum, the IRS is most likely auditing you for uh, supposedly falsely claiming a tax credit. And so they will send you a letter saying, we don't think that you deserve this tax credit and we're just not gonna give you the money. And the onerous is on the taxpayer to prove that they deserve that tax credit. So how the audit proceeds is a little bit different. Um, audits can pose a heavy burden on individuals uh, and can even lead to financial hardship. A report from the National Taxpayer Advocate um, said that this is particularly true for low-income individuals as they can rely on tax refunds for rent payments, car payments, etc. And so given the high stakes nature of IRS tax audits, it's important that we find an allocation system that distributes audits equally with respect to taxpayer income. And that's what we're hoping to do here. Um, so with all of this in mind, sort of the question that I'm approaching in this first product is how can we make a machine learning based audit selection system as fair as possible, big asterisk given institutional constraints with respect to an individual's income and what tools can we leverage? Yes? Why do you want to uh, allocate them equally? Like, should, oh, we're not going to allocate them okay. equally. Not at all. Like, wouldn't you expect like, the, the bigger gap to be coming from like higher income? We, let me guess. Okay. Definitely. I apologize if that was the impression that I gave. I mean, fairly, but definitely not equally. Yes. Um, yeah. Can you also just explain one more time how the two different audits work? Okay. Yeah. So um, I don't know if this is very helpful, but basically when you're on the higher end of the income spectrum, uh, the IRS will do an investigation first, usually one where they will uh, either send out an auditor to you or like have an auditor correspond with you in some way. Um, and they won't kind of uh, request the external funds until they've already kind of proven that you um, owe more money. Meanwhile, if you're on the lower end of the income spectrum and you're claiming a tax credit, so you're saying like, hey, you know, uh, I make under the income cap for the earned income tax credit, that's an income subsidy for um, working families, uh, I think I should get like a $6,000 tax refund from the IRS. The IRS will be like, eh, it doesn't look like you qualify, send you a letter saying that doesn't look like you qualify. Um, and then won't send you the tax refund. And then it's on you to basically say like, no, I really do deserve this credit. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So when you have, it's, you sort of have two modes of it. I mean, is it explicit because for higher income and lower income? Or is no, it's explicit for the tax credits. So the, the credit refunds are different from the non-credit refunds. It just so happens that most people claiming tax credits are on the lower end of the income spectrum. Especially, so especially the tax credits that they pay the most attention to. So the biggest tax credits, like the earned income tax credit, are on the lower end of the income spectrum. And so that's why this modality And, and is it related to whether you owe taxes or are requesting a refund, or is it just related to whether the audit is about the tax credit or about the income that you receive? That's a good question. I know that they particularly pay attention to the earned income tax credit in particular. I haven't heard about um, whether or not you're getting money back or, or paying money in general. I know that it's centered around, especially the earned income tax credit. In the interest of time, do you mind if I continue? Okay, great. Um, all right, so this is the question that I'm sort of tackling. Uh, what tools can we leverage to make a machine learning system as um, fair as possible given institutional constraints? So to answer these questions, uh, I get to look at real IRS tax data, anonymized, of course. Um, so I have two data sets, the National Research Program data, which is Oh my gosh, I can't believe a random sample, a statistical random sample that the IRS uh, collects on a yearly basis. They use it to estimate the tax gap. We use it for research purposes. so We don't have to worry about selection bias um, when we're doing these experiments. Uh, and then there's also operational audits. These are risk selected audits. Um, I have them from actually 2010 to 2014 as well. Uh, and these are audits that are selected uh, and have been done to actually recover the tax gap over the last several years. So. Uh, yes. So can you say it's a random sample? It's like they randomly audited seventy thousand people. They randomly audited seventy thousand people. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> and so both of these data sets essentially look the same. You just know which one is which because you need to know which one is the random sample and which isn't. And each row is just 
an individual person's tax return anonymized. Um, and then also the result of the audit. So that they were audited and how much money they owed if they owed money at all. Yeah. So they, they would, uh, that's a good question. They would, um, so actually it probably is both. That's a good question if they did correspondence audits in the random sample. I know that they had the same kind of examiner look over each person's tax returns and then decide, oh my God, do they owe money or not? And then they would pursue the audit um, if they did in fact owe money. So they would probably take whichever um, method was the method that was used for that particular type of suspected tax fraud, but I'm not entirely sure that's a good question. Um, so we use the NRP data to train all of our machine learning models, uh, but we use operational data to investigate the status quo of IRS tax audit behavior, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit about really briefly now. Um, so here we have a graph of the IRS audit rate by income in 2014. The y-axis is audit rate and the x-axis is income in thousands. So each point on this line is um, a bucket of 10,000 people, sorry, a bucket of people that make between uh, you know, zero and ten thousand dollars, ten and twenty, etc. So this is a million over here. Um, and uh, what we can see here, uh, I'm going to talk about two sort of motivating facts here. Um, firstly, is that at least in most recent years, very low income individuals and high income individuals are audited at the same rate. So we can see here people making um, above around $50,000 or below $50,000 and between $700,000 and a million dollars here, depending on where you hit this bumpy line, um, are audited at the same rate and everyone in between is audited at a lower rate. And I'll just say really quickly, um, this also transfers over to when we plot this graph in terms of income deciles. So that last graph was in terms of income bu buckets of $10,000. This is uh, 10 percentiles of income with the lower with the number here being the lower bound of income on um, each of those percentiles. So this is a zero to 10th, the 10th to 20th, et cetera. Um, and so what we can see is that that spike that looks small in that first graph actually makes up a large portion of the US population. Um, right. And however, you know, that's maybe bad enough, but if we look about if we look at actual tax non-compliance as a function of income, again, this is income decile. Uh, this is non-compliance over $200. Um, so like whether or not someone misreports on their taxes above $200, we see that non-compliance actually increases roughly monotonically in income. So these two facts together sort of bring us to, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, the x-axis here again was the uh, income deciles with the income on the bottom end of the decile and then the y-axis was the misreport rate, um, the percentage of the population that's misreporting over $200. Um, and these two facts together leads to sort of a motivating question of how we'll understand equity in this context. If misreporting increases monotonically in income, why is there such a focus on the lower end of the income spectrum? Yeah. Question. Is this, when you say income, is this sort of the verified post-audit income or the pre the reported income pre-audit? This is adjusted gross income post-audit. Post-audit. So I would have guessed if the spike was because you don't report any income. That's very suspicious. Yeah, no. This is because I don't want to spoil everything, but I can actually, I'm not going to talk about the fact that it's uh, about this too, too much in this uh, presentation. So I'm happy to talk about this more offline, but basically, Audits on the low end of the income spectrum are very cheap, and the return on investment is almost unbeatable. Um, so if you are in a resource-constrained IRS, you don't have that much money, your budget's been decreasing year to year, the best way, the most sure way to make sure you're getting um, millions of dollars back is actually by targeting low-income individuals, especially because you know, it's a letter instead of sending out a person, right? And then also they have this rule that if you don't respond to that letter, that's taken as an admission of non-compliance and they won't send you the money. So you have all these low-income people who maybe, yeah. Make sure, did you get it? So if, if I really yeah, want zero dollar income, I'm like, um, I get and they find out I have $50,000. Then is the 50,000 in this figure or the zero? The 50. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. 
So this is just per, this is percent of income that's misreported, percent of returns that have any amount of misreported. This is percent of returns that have over two hundred dollars misreported. Okay. Yes. Um, no, 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 no problem. Um, I'm glad that you guys have questions. This is great. Um, okay, so I'll quickly define the audit problem before moving on to our understanding of equity in this context. So uh, the IRS has many, many, many objectives that it wants to accomplish when it's making an audit allocation. Uh, they want, among other things, an audit allocation that maximizes revenue. So they want to reclaim as much of the tax gap as possible. They also want to minimize the no change rate. So they don't like it when they audit individuals who do not actually owe excess tax. Um, they also want to deter all taxpayers from misreporting. So even if you're not getting audited, you should be afraid that you will be because they don't want you to misreport on your taxes, right? Um, and it also has to respect two different forms of a budget. One is a um, number of audits or a percentage of the population budget because you have to have enough IRS auditors to do all the audits that you want to do. And if you do too many audits, that's not going to happen. Um, and then this is a little bit slightly softer, but still exists. There's also, you have to stay within a dollar budget. Audits cost money to do, and you can't do more expensive audits or more audits than you have money within your organization to do. Um, and then finally, you also have to respect some further institutional constraints about pressures that Congress has put on you to look into certain kinds of taxpayers or um, certain kinds of rules about uh, what to look at um, when you're investigating tax returns. And on top of all of this, I'm still saying let's create an equitable system that, you know, as equitable as possible with respect to income. So seeing all of this, you know, one response might be, okay, let's make a crazy, you know, multi-objective problem, solve all of this at once. Um, but uh, while there are some people at my lab actually working on coming up with like an optimal auditing procedure, I think it's a really hard question to come up with a, a system that, you know, takes into account all of these constraints at once, especially because equity and deterrence are really hard to formalize. Uh, so what happens in practice and how we're going to think about this problem is a two part process. In one part, a machine learning model um, predicts uh, risk for misreporting. And then in the second part of the process, there is some policy informed heuristics that take those predictions into an actual audit allocation. And I think it's also useful to think about these things beyond the fact that that's, you know, largely what actually happens in practice. Uh, one central question in this research project is, you know, how well do um, some more typical machine learning fairness interventions work at preventing uh, bias in machine learning models. And for that, we need our classic, like here is a classification model that does a prediction and we can slap some constraints in. So useful for us. So with all that being said, the super, super simplified audit problem uh, is that we are going to maximize the output of, um, we're going to maximize the output of predicted value from a machine learning model subject to a budget. So uh, this is the predicted probability of misreport if you're using a classification model that's trained on zero one outputs, or if you're using a regression model um, that's trained to predict the expected amount of uh, how much people owe on their taxes, the tax liability, it would be, you know, the sum of of those outputs um, such that the number of audits that you do is less than your audit budget or the percentage of audits that you do is less than your audit budget. So in this situation, we're using a budget as a percentage of the population. We use 0.644% uh, because that is the average audit rate between 2010 and 2014. Uh, so thus, after prediction, just to make things super clear and super simple, what this amounts to is that you have a machine learning model, you rank your predictions in terms of raw output, and you take the top 0.0644%, and that is your audit allocation. All right, sorry, the, the constraint here is just on the number of audits, or it could be weighted? Uh, your audit budget. Your audit budget is just the number of audits that you do. So yeah, that's the way that we're starting. Um, <clears throat> but the way that we're evaluating our allocations is by seeing a, how much revenue they produce, how much is reclaimed by the IRS, um, and the no change rate. So the rate of auditing individuals who do not actually owe um, more tax. <clears throat> uh, does this make sense to everyone? And also, of course, vertical equity, which I will get to in a moment. But deterrence and all those other things are a little bit too complicated for now. So we're just basically saying we want high revenue. We want a low rate of auditing people who don't actually owe excess tax. And we're also going to think about uh, fairness equity. So again, this is revenue, not uh, sort of IRS profit. This is net revenue. 
It no. doesn't account for the cost of their audits. So the revenue calculation does actually take uh, take into account the cost of their audits. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, so our goal here is to increase equity without decreasing revenue and uh, increasing the rate at which individuals are um, audited who do not actually owe excess tax. Um, and of course, we want to create things, uh, create the allocation to be as fair as possible. So I'm quickly going to talk about how we think about fairness in this context. Um, so uh, what are our fairness desiderata here? Uh, to understand this question, we borrow this idea from the public finance literature called vertical equity, which is centered around the idea that in order to achieve fairness, you should uh, acknowledge the differences between individuals and treat them appropriately differently in order to achieve fairness. And this is a little bit from a um, little bit different from a lot of the common definitions in the fairness literature, which I would argue cluster sort of around this other related idea that the public finance literature calls horizontal equity, which is that we think of all people as equal, so we want to treat them the same all the time. So this leads to, you know, equalizing rates, demographic disparity, equalized true positive, false positive rates, etc. Um, so vertical equity is a fairness definition. I don't have a definition up on the slide. It's more of a framework from which we're thinking about how to think about equity in this context, and it requires information about the actual application to make sense. And so how do we make sense of it in this situation? Uh, well, first, you know, we notice that audits pose varying burdens on people uh, depending on their income. So people with less money might experience a higher burden from having an IRS tax audit. And so we prefer slightly, um, we prefer allocations that decrease audit focus on lower income individuals. So we want things to be kind of monotonic. We prefer more monotonicity in our audit allocation. Uh, and a little bit more, another um, way that we're conceptualizing fairness here is that we also want audit selection to closely reflect the um, allocation of an oracle, where an oracle model in this case is a model that knows who misreported, how much everyone misreported, and selects individuals in terms, in order of how much they misreported on their taxes. <clears throat> um, and how we're going to measure how much the uh, a given model's allocation corresponds to that of the oracle is we just measure the overlap in their allocation. So how many people do they audit in common over the total number of audits? That's uh, in absolute or in percentage? Uh, the, the calculation or so we, we take the absolute number of people that they have in common. And then we divide by the total number of people in the audit, which is going to be the same size. So the be. oracle, like the, the oracle, you said, is related to the amount that they misreported. Is that the absolute amount or the relative amount? The absolute amount. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so now that we have this, um, now that we sort of know how we're thinking about fairness in this context, I can say finally, what do we want? We want uh, to increase vertical equity without uh, hurting revenue and no change rate. So that means we want more monotonic allocations that are close to this notion of the oracle with high revenue and low no change rate. Um, does this make sense? Sorry, I missed yeah. something. What does oracle mean? Is that like the ground truth? That's the so that's the model that um, basically selects people for audit in order of how much they're non-compliant on their taxes. So it's like it's kind of like a ground truth model, but it's like a model that has perfect knowledge. And how much non-compliant is that like it's how uh, how much they extra money they owe yeah, to the IRS. Yeah. Okay, not yeah. like one violation, it's the actual it's the actual amount of money. Yeah. Um, no problem. Okay. So now I will get to the results that we saw in this project. So firstly, um, you know, the IRS was looking to get into these more high power machine learning models to use for audit allocation. So we used random forests on um, on the IRS tax data. This is not what they use on a day-to-day -day basis, at least not yet. So don't worry, this is not the, the model that they actually use. Um, but here we have the audit rate by income of the allocation of a random forest classification model predicting whether or not someone is likely to misreport on their taxes. So this model is trained on binary outcomes. Um, and so on the y-axis, we have audit rate. On the x-axis, we have income in thousands per income decile, where the income is the lower end of the decile. The black line shows the audit rate by income of the random forest uh, Oracle, uh, the random forests uh, model allocation, and then the red line shows the allocation of that of the Oracle. And remember, we're talking about allocations here and not all of the models predictions. So this is just the distribution over the top 0.644% of predictions. 
because this is the Oracle allocation, this is a model's allocation and not all of its predictions. So I'm not, I'm not saying that this is what like every single person that the random forest model selected for audit, this is just the top 0.644%, which would be exactly who we would audit. It's about 1.25 million people. Does that make sense? Yes. How do you calculate the Oracle? Is it so we have the true amount of money that each person misreported in the NRP data? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the no change rate on this is pretty good. Uh, it, you know, doesn't audit virtually anyone who doesn't misreport on their taxes. It only has a, mis a, a no change rate of about 3.5%, which is an increase from some of the more simple model that the IRS had been using earlier. Um, but it has a pretty big problem, which is that in this, you know, using this model, it pretty much only audits people in the lower to middle income classes and doesn't target people on the higher end of the income spectrum at all. Um, so to fix this problem, we first try to use some off the shelf bias mitigation. Uh, we enforce equalized odds, which in this case is enforcing that across different income bins. So we bin incomes by the percentiles that we've been seeing. So each income bin is 10 percentiles of the population. Zero to 10 is one bin, 10 to 20 is another, et cetera. Um, we enforce equalized odds over the uh, income bins. So we, that, that means that we're enforcing that the probability that a compliant or non-compliant tax paper, payer is subject to audit does not depend on their income bin. And we implement this with Fairlearn from Microsoft. Um, and as an example of our results, uh, consider this graph of audit rate by income decile here. That's the same x and y axis from before. And we just have the addition of this blue model, which is an equalized odds constrained random forest classifier. Um, and we basically notice three things. Firstly, is that um, because because uh, we have a budgeted allocation here, we're only using the top 0.644% of the model's predictions. Equalized odds, while it's satisfied on the whole population as a result of using um, this method or post-processing methods, it's not satisfied on just this portion of the population. So equalized odds uh, isn't exactly satisfied here. Um, and, you know, but there is some marginal equity improvement, although it is marginal. Uh, there is, you know, some focus on higher uh, income populations, but not um, a huge amount and definitely still like a huge gap with relation to the Oracle. And as you can see, the Oracle overlap is uh, only about 4%. So we increased by about 4%, which isn't maybe amazing given what we're going for. Um, and finally, what I'll note here is that there are some pretty high trade-offs. So uh, we decrease revenue from 3 billion originally to 0.5 billion, so around $2.5 billion decrease in revenue, not leaving you with very much. Uh, and we also increase the no change rate by about 10%. So not, not super amazing uh, in terms of, yeah. Do you have a sense of why? auditing uh, high income individuals so like at such a low rate like why utilize odds makes sense as the way to fix this or if there's yeah so we because we were saying earlier that like one of our notions of fairness was kind of like monotonicity um we showed that equalized odds under the the this under certain conditions will um enforce monotonicity in audit rate but it's unclear how to enforce it over just a portion of the population. So we did it over the whole population and it didn't kind of like follow through. Um, so there, that was the reason why equalized odds sort of made sense. We also did some other fairness metrics just, you know, for, I don't know, completion sake, but this is what I'm focusing on in the presentation. Yeah. Wait, so your, your, your predictor just outputs audit or not, right? Rather than not things among both? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. So you did the equalized odds to use this to target the but equalized odds, the actual, but the face in the real, the, the amount owed or just whether no, it's zero or one prediction. or is it used? Everything is trained here on zero one predictions of whether or not they were over $200. So it's like, were you non compliant or not? Oh, but you're not going to audit all of them. But what you're showing here is. So not... this is the population of people that I am going to audit because this is the top 0.644% right. of those predictions because we're taking the maximum. Uh, raw, you know, uh, in this case, the raw maximum raw probability of misreport based on the random models, random force models prediction. So it's since it's predicting zero one, it's kind of like, you know, how likely am I to have misreported on my taxes? Wait, wait, so the random force is outputting just zero one. Yes, exactly. One on 
just sorry no it's it's so the you can get the random forest to output between zero and one like how how close to one it thinks it is right so like it's trained on zero one but there's a raw output that is between so zero you're using and one. the row output exactly oh i see okay yes but but, but post processing for equalized on then so this is in processing we also have post processing and the results are effectively the same even if you post process after sort of accounting for the 6%. Yeah. So, okay, so if you, we didn't do post processing accounting just for the 6%. We did do, okay, maybe it's somewhere in the paper, but I think the tricky thing, no, it's not. The tricky thing is there is like, you have to keep on going deeper into the set to, to satisfy that. So it's kind of unclear how you would do it on just the allocation, if that makes sense. Like to get, to get equalized odds on just the top 0.644%, since you don't have the individuals to make it satisfy equalized odds, you would have to keep on pulling up from later and later in the ranking. And yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so I guess I, with two questions. One is what would it look like if instead of trying to predict the, the audit rate, you tried to predict the actual amount? That's what we're getting to. And then what about if you, and try to enforce like calibration conditions that are specific to just those highest bids instead of like that. Maybe we can talk about later, but just in the interest of time, I'm about to get to what you're saying. Yes, because um, I also want to get to my second paper, hopefully. Um, so exactly what you said. So we didn't find this to be extremely effective. What can we do instead? We can change the model's prediction task as an intervention to um, increase equity in this setting. So if we switch from training on zero one labels, whether or not someone has misreported to their taxes to the expect to the amount that they've misreported on the taxes so that the model is now predicting the expected amount of misreport, we can see here already this is a lot closer to the Oracle and focuses a lot more on the um, upper income classes. Uh, so this is the audit rate by income of the audit allocation of a random forest model that is predicting the expected adjustment. Um, and so you know, I don't have to dwell too much about this. Basically, it works a lot better, right? The equity improvement is great, has the largest um, equity, uh, the largest Oracle overlap up to 23%. It's just about as monotonic as the Oracle, which is nice. Uh, and it also has lower trade offs So we actually have a $7 billion increase in revenue. So now we're increasing, we have a $10 billion revenue um, from this model where we only had $3 billion when we did the, the predicting on zero one labels before. And while we do have a steep decrease in no change rate, at least we are only decreasing one metric instead of two. So the trade-offs here, I would say are better. Yeah. The last uh, method you showed is much closer to the actual deployed system, right? Um, yes, so the IRS currently predicts on zero one yeah, labels, right. but as a result of some of the work that we've been doing, they're switching to regression. Which is a fun success story. Yeah. How does a no change rate um, um, track for income? Uh, yeah, so it's much higher in the higher income um, echelon. Like the 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 rate of auditing people who don't actually owe excess tax is much higher the higher income you go, and that's related to I forget who was asking this question earlier. I think it was Charlotte. Why why do we think the models are not targeting high income individuals? I think the feature set that the IRS has access to is abysmal for predicting um, non-compliance on high income individuals. And so you have just a whole lot more uncertainty on the higher end of the income spectrum, which is why even though audit rate increases monotonically in income, you just don't have the information to target that part of the population. Um, and what I'm working on now as a follow-up is building systems specifically designed for high wealth tax evasion. So that's like my follow-up work. Um, so uh, What's like what fraction of the variance can you explain generally? That is a great question that I would love to know the answer to, and I should probably do some research to answer exactly that, but I don't know. Oh. Oh, I just couldn't hear. Yeah. Oh, I was just asking like what's like the R square for like the current model. Oh. Um, I, for this like for this regression problem that you showed. Me. I am sure that is in the paper somewhere, but I don't know it off the top of my head. <laughs> um, so the takeaways here uh, are, you know, modeling changes beyond just slapping a constraint on top of a model during prediction time or uh, at during optimization time. Um, you know, instead intervening at the prediction target or other places along the pipeline can actually successfully increase 
desired fairness behavior and practice, which is awesome because sometimes those traditional approaches don't often work super well out of the box as we saw in this situation. And um, I will note really quickly, you know, you could say, Emily, good for you, you solved audits, like, you know, does this just fix the whole situation? No, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And I'm happy to talk about that offline, but I definitely don't have time for it right now. Um, so um, what if we can't take advantage of all of that flexibility? What if we can't rebuild our whole model from sort of the ground up? Well, uh, you know, what if we have our data source and prediction target kind of set and we have almost no wiggle room to make allowances for fairness with respect to accuracy? Well, what I'm going to talk about now is that we still have a lot of flexibility um, to uh, increase fairness behavior, even when we're keeping the model exactly as accurate as it was before or like with an epsilon. Uh, and these constraints actually make it a lot easier to connect um, uh, to the law and increase legal pressure on organizations to search for the fairest model out there. Um, <clears throat> so now I'm focusing on the situation where we've already defined our prediction task and perhaps we can't sacrifice any performance change for fairness, but as increasingly uh, many works have shown, there are still so many models that have equivalent accuracy yet differ substantially in other properties like fairness, but also robustness, interpretability, among others. Um, this phenomenon has been called many different things by many people over the last several years. So starting all the way back in 2001, the Rashomon effect by uh, Bremen, or Bremen, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Uh, more recently, predictive multiplicity by Marx et al., leaving out unfairness by a paper I had a little bit a while ago, um, and under specification by Diamore et al. Uh, and, you know, what my co-authors and I attempt to do in this the second work that I'm going to talk to you about is to unify our understanding of this phenomenon where there are multiple equally accurate models for the same task with noticeably different behaviors. Um, uh, give a little bit more detail on how this arises and its technical legal and policy consequences. So we call this phenomenon of multiple models existing for the same prediction task model multiplicity. Um, and under the umbrella of this term, we uh, break things up into procedural and predictive multiplicity, which I'll define and talk about in a minute. Um, I'll just note quickly that a lot of the work in the fact community sort of implicitly takes advantage of this, um, uh, of this phenomenon because the, the mere goal of saying, I'm going to you know, uh, enforce a fairness constraint on a model and hope that it has minimal accuracy trade-off or no accuracy trade-off is implicitly taking advantage of the fact that, that this is happening, um, but maybe we don't think about it as you know, all these possible models existing for the same task as much. Um, and even though that's a great thing that we can take advantage of, there are also risks posed by this phenomenon. Namely, if we have all these equally accurate models that exist for the same task that do differ in other behaviors, we can essentially be arbitrarily choosing between models that have suboptimal fairness behavior, suboptimal robustness behavior, or suboptimal predictions for individual people, which can lead to some fairness repercussions there. Um, but first I'll start with some definitions. Uh, we have predictive multiplicity, which is when there are differences in predictions between equally accurate models. So you have the same person over different models with the same accuracy leading to varying predictions. Um, maybe this is already seeming kind of like, whoa, uh, there could be some fairness problems here based on which model you choose. So I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, more formally, if you have distribution D of data, um, and you have X or it pairs X, Y from D, um, and you have some distribution of binary classification models M that have more or less equivalent accuracy, we define the predictive multiplicity over M to be uh, the expectation over different models in M that, the, uh, that their prediction on two random points in D will be different. So the disagreement is actually the expected disagreement over models in M. Um, we also talk about procedural multiplicity a lot in the paper. This is where there are differences in model internals that don't get shown in predictions. So how we most often see this is when there's inconsistency in model explanations. So even if you have the same prediction, if you ask a model, why did I get this prediction? Models with the same accuracy might say like, oh, you didn't get it because you're, you didn't get approved for credit because your income wasn't high enough. And another one will say it's because your credit history wasn't long enough or whatever it may be. Um, and this can also lead to some inconsistency and confusion, but I'm not gonna formalize this because most of the results that I have ever are centered around predictive multiplicity. So if you're interested in this, please read the paper for more information. Um, and I'll just, briefly go through some theoretical results around accuracy variance and uh, predictive multiplicity. Um, so 
you know, you might think, Emily, why are you worried about this? Obviously, uh, the more accurate your models are, the less predictive multiplicity you're going to have. So we don't really have to think about this very much at all. And then while some sense this is true, um, as uh, no mod to no two models can disagree on a percentage of points in D that's over two times the model's error. So if the error of all the models in M is L star, you can't have more disagreement than two L star. Uh, and we also show that, though I won't go into the proof, is that in the limit, as the error of our models approach the Bayes error, predictive multiplicity goes to zero. Um, while all of this all of this is true, so it might seem like, okay, we don't really have to worry about predictive multiplicity because the more accurate you get, you know, when you find your Bayes optimal model, you don't have to think about the fact that there are all these different models with all these different behaviors. Um, but actually things are kind of more complicated than this. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so, um, no, actually, it doesn't have to be zero. It just has to be a predictable problem. So the Bayes risk can't be such that the you always get like 50-50 um, error. Um, I can show you the proof in the paper if that works, yeah. Um, things are a little bit more complicated than this. And to see why we have to turn to the standard bias variance decompositions of error, we show that multiplicity is tightly related to variance. And so any attempts to increase accuracy by increasing variance as well will actually lead to more model multiplicity and not less, obviously, until you get to like the, the optimal predictor. Um, and so to see this, uh, we create this mode predictor over the models M, which just returns the most common prediction over all of the models M. We define the variance to be the expected difference between the mode predictor and, and any given model. Um, and what we show is that the model multiplicity is bounded on both sides by the variance and thus, you know, increasing variance. So it will increase model multiplicity and specifically reducing a model's loss by trading off bias for variance and increasing the model's variance will increase predictive multiplicity. Um, so, uh, you know, while models with optimal accuracy won't display predictive multiplicity, the road to improving accuracy will often be paved with more and more model multiplicity, depending on whether you're deploying more complex models to achieve this. And as we often don't get optimal models in practice, this actually happens um, quite a lot of the time. And uh, this does actually happen in practice. Um, this is a quick example from um, a paper of mine a few years ago. Uh, Basically, we have deep models on the left and linear models on the right. The accuracy increase of going from linear to deep is over 10%. But if we see, like, this is a little bit complicated, but right here, these, this is the amount of differences in predictions over leave one out changes to a model's training set in linear models. And then the blue is for deep. And as we can see, even though these models are much more accurate up here, um, there's a lot more differences in predictions, so a lot more predictive multiplicity. Um, uh, um, in those deep models. So um, I'm going to start to close out my talk um, with uh, some opportunities, concerns, and recommendations based on the fact that model multiplicity exists. As I kind of showed <laughs> a little bit quickly in those theoretical results, we can't just expect that model multiplicity is going to go away with increased accuracy. We do actually have to grapple with the fact that there are multiple equally accurate models for any given prediction task. Um, so there are some nice things about this. We have a lot more flexibility than we maybe originally think about to take advantage of models um, to find and then use models that have the best fairness behavior among those that are equally accurate. Um, and we can do this not just for predictions, but also for models internals. We can build models specifically with the behavior in mind of having there be, for example, more easily attainable recourse. So having, you know, in a credit, uh, credit allocation model, you can prefer models that have an easier path for someone to be able to change their prediction to get a good outcome after getting a bad one. Um, and interestingly, this is where one of the places where a legal connection comes in. So the fact that there are so many equally accurate models um, with different fairness behavior can lead to um, legal pressure to search for and choose the most fair model. So this is based on the disparate impact doctrine. So the disparate impact doctrine is a piece of law that says um, it applies to credit housing and employment contexts, among some others. And it says that if you, you know, are an organization and you're using a model 
or any other decision process that I'm talking about models here, that model can only treat individuals of different uh, demographic groups differently if, they're, if the business can demonstrate a legitimate business need uh, to have this disparate impact across groups, right? Um, and in practice, this legitimate business need is often understood to mean that you um, need to have that disparate impact in order to get the accuracy that your model is presenting. And so what model multiplicity shows is that even if, you know, even if the business doesn't want to give up anything in terms of accuracy, there is probably still a better model out there that has better fairness behavior if they weren't, you know, explicitly looking for that. Um, and so there can be legal pressure to sort of search among the space of models that are um, equally uh, effective to the one that you have and find the best one with respect to fairness. In this case, this would probably be demographic disparity because that's often what's focused on in these um, legal matters. Um, of course, the flip side, and this is why the legal pressure is necessary, is that if you don't specifically look for fairer models, you're probably going to end up with one that isn't the best. Um, I'm going to skip this for now. Um, finally, I think, yeah, this is my last sort of idea. Um, a nice thing about having many similar models with slightly different predictions is that it can be a natural bulwark against algorithmic monoculture, which is the fear that all companies in the same um, area, so like all algorithmic hiring models will use a very similar model to base their to to use in their company. And so when they use the same or similar model, they'll get all the same predictions and they'll systematically exclude certain individuals. Um, and we can see since even like tiny changes to a model's building process can lead to a substantial number of different predictions, this um, this may not be as huge of a of a concern as we might think, or at least in some cases it won't be. Um, of course, the flip side of that is that uh, there is sort of a lack of justifiability in the current de facto um, process for choosing which model to use. If we choose models on the basis of accuracy alone, uh, that is sort of akin to choosing between very disparate outcomes for individuals with no real justification because both of these models performed equally well. So for the, for the business's perspective, you could have used either of them, but for this individual, um, it had very different outcomes. <clears throat> and so model multiplicity brings attention to the fact that in order to fully justify model decisions and procedures in high stakes contexts, we have to justify the choice of model as well as the model's internal decision process. Um, and uh, <clears throat> some even, yeah, this might not seem like, oh, it's a random choice, it's not that bad. And I wanna distinguish between arbitrariness and random here. So I'm borrowing from uh, this paper, May the Odds Ever Be in Your Favor, Lotteries and Law by Perry and Zarsky. And they say, the, the decision to opt for chance must be reasoned. So you can have an arbitrary decision. An arbitrary decision is one that's made without thought. You don't know that you're making a choice between these two disparate outcomes for a given person, but you can choose for that decision to be random for some you know, legitimate reason, and that can be a fine thing. So what we're trying to get rid of is arbitrariness and not randomness necessarily. Um, there is a lot of writing in the law about how arbitrariness is undesirable from the Fair Credit Reporting Act and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Uh, they have a lot of sort of language about how there shouldn't be arbitrary decisions in high stakes uh, applications like credit, um, credit scoring and credit allocation. Um, so we think that, you know, this might carry over to have some impact on um, how we should select models in these uh, applications, given that there's this legal language that says that arbitrariness is bad, but there isn't anything in like the exact letter of the law that says that you have to justify the model selection process at the moment, just the explanation within the model, although a growing number of legal scholars are making the argument that in order to fully justify a model's decision, you shouldn't just justify why that particular model made a given decision, but also why that model was chosen in the first place, and to sort of um, add to that justification, we basically recommend documenting why you've made every single choice along this pipeline and between that justification of how you got to the model that you arrive at plus the model's decision justification will justify um, why you have a given prediction for a given individual. And uh, 
even if you do all of these things, you're probably still going to have a bunch of models that satisfy all of the things that you want from a given application. Um, and if that's the case, you can aggregate. If you still, okay, so sometimes you might want randomness because you want to prevent alg algorithmic monoculture or something along those lines. But in other cases, um, you uh, might actually just want one prediction, one non random prediction from. Uh, uh, for a given application, like say in criminal justice proceedings or um, other super high stakes uh, situations. And in that case, you can just combine the outputs of a bunch of models that satisfy all of the things that you want them to satisfy, fairness and accuracy or whatever they may be. Um, maybe perhaps I'm taking the mode prediction and reaching a more stable output. And I have a paper on how to reach stability by doing this called selective ensembling for a consistent prediction. So feel free to look into that if you're interested in that idea. Um, but um, that brings me to the end of this talk. And what I hope that you took away from this is that the AI pipeline can expand our toolbox of uh, bias mitigation techniques. We saw this in the IRS case study. We can leverage you know, a lot of the choices that we make along the model building pipeline to enforce fairness in different um, real world applications. And uh, also that the choices along the AI pipeline have important policy and legal implications. So even the fact that we have so many equally accurate models or really models in general for the same prediction task means that we have to think carefully about why we're making each choice along the model building process. We should be able to justify that choice and hopefully document that choice. Um, and if we choose models that are not the fairest in certain situations, uh, you know, if we're at a big company, we might be liable for not choosing that particular model. Um, yeah, that's my talk. Thank you so much, guys. Randomized classifier, you can construct a multiple set of classifiers, which, which have like for every random string, classifier. Right, right. And that would have high product predictive multiplicity. Yeah, but so if you're, I think the point that we're trying to make here is that if you're cognizant that that's a choice that you're making and you've decided that that's better for your application um, context, then that's fine. You can choose to be random. That's great. What we're trying to prevent against here is that someone essentially, you know, is trying to make a, a credit um, allocation model, a loan allocation model. They're like, all right, I'm just going to choose the most accurate one, not knowing that, you know, there are a like infinitely many models that satisfy that criteria. There's this whole set of models that are equally accurate, and that if you looked within them, you could find models that are much more fair or much more robust. Um, or have other properties that they may desire, and they're just not taking advantage of that flexibility at all. So it's more the thoughtlessness that we're trying to go against, and the fact that people, I think, often just think like, okay, optimize, optimize for my um, optimization criteria, and I just assume that I'm going to get the optimal model. But really, we don't often get the optimal model in practice. And when we're not at the optimal model, we're in this situation where we have this kind of whole pool of models that we are equally effective and we should be reasoning among why we choose one over another within that set. If that makes sense. Yeah. Let's take the rest of this discussion over the break. Thank you.